Hi everyone. Welcome to this webinar, Parallel Computing with MATLAB. My name is Jiro Doke, and I'm an application engineer at MathWorks. So what is this webinar about? Well, it's about what these customers of MathWorks are doing with their applications. They're taking their computationally large applications and reducing the amount of time it takes to process them by factors or even orders of magnitude. And that's what this session is about. But if you think about acceleration strategies in general in MATLAB, there are actually several approaches that you can take. Probably the one of the most fundamental way of accelerating your code is to use best coding practices by using techniques such as pre-allocation or vectorization, which have nothing to do with parallel computing, but they're just uh, good coding practices in general to use in MATLAB. Uh, you can also use tools such as Profiler to identify bottlenecks within your code. And these are techniques covered in other webinars, including speeding up MATLAB applications. Then there's using more hardware, uh, such as uh, using more processors, cores, or GPUs by using MATLAB's parallel computing tools. And then you can also integrate with other languages, languages such as C, C++, and Fortran, and you can integrate them using the MEX interface or the MATLAB executable interface. You can also generate C code from your MATLAB algorithms using MATLAB Coder. But all of these approaches, you can also scale it up even further onto a cluster by making use of additional hardware resources. So in this session, we're going to go through some introduction to our parallel computing tools, uh, look at some of the things you can do on a uh, multi-core, multi-processor computer, uh, things you can do on GPUs uh, or graphics processing units, and finally scaling up to a cluster environment. But before we do that, I do like to mention that MATLAB alone is already a multi-threaded application. Uh, so since 2008, a, uh, MATLAB has been a multi-threaded application. We use multi-threaded libraries such as BLAS and, and LAPAC for linear algebra. So if you're doing those sort of operations, uh, linear algebra, numerical computations, MATLAB is already doing multi-threaded uh, calculations. If you are on a machine with multiple cores and processors, MATLAB automatically makes use of them uh, to do that uh, multi-threaded. Okay? Uh, today, what we're going to be focusing on is using parallel computing tools to do explicit parallel processing, things beyond the built-in multi-threading within MATLAB. So we're going to talk about some of the programming constructs that come with our parallel computing tools to convert your serial MATLAB code over to parallel MATLAB code. So what does it mean to go beyond serial MATLAB applications? So you see MATLAB desktop here, or we'll call it client. Uh, this is probably the MATLAB that you're used to seeing, which is a MATLAB that you, you would start up. It's an application, desktop application, uh, typically a single user application. But to go beyond that uh, single MATLAB is, uh, is to use additional MATLAB sessions, which we call workers, uh, to, to help do the computation uh, more efficiently and, and, and quickly. So MATLAB Worker is essentially the same thing as a MATLAB desktop client, except that it doesn't have a front end. It's just the computation engine. Um, it doesn't have a desktop or the command window, and it, it's solely responsible for just doing the calculations. And these MATLAB workers are able to communicate with each other as well as with the client so that the MATLAB client can uh, create some work to do for the workers, send it over to the workers, and then the workers will do the processing, and then afterwards the client can gather the results from the workers to do any sort of post-processing uh, that's necessary. Okay, So that's what we mean by doing parallel processing uh, by making use of these workers. The tool that enables you to do parallel processing in MATLAB is the Parallel Computing Toolbox. The, the, the main uh, purpose of it is to speed up your computation by creating parallel applications. 
And with that, with the parallel computing toolbox, you can also make use of the local hardware resources, including CPUs and also GPUs, if you have the appropriate GPUs. Um, but also, you can use it as a, a prototyping environment for scaling up to a cluster. So if your end goal is to run a large simulation in parallel on a cluster, you can first prototype uh, perhaps in a, for, with a small subset of your data locally. And once you know that it works locally, you can easily port that over to a, a cluster environment with very little or no code change. Now, the computer cluster that I mentioned here could be a physical cluster with multiple computers that's connected by network, or it could be a, a cloud service such as uh, EC2. All right, so let's take a look at what uh, you can do, what sort of pro parallel processing you can do on a multi-core, multi-processor machine. So the Parallel Computing Toolbox provides various uh, ways of doing parallel processing in MATLAB. Some are very easy, out-of-the-box functionality, um, but kind of specific to a certain task. Uh, we also provide very low-level functions that give you full control of how you might want to do your parallel processing. So let's start with the, the easiest, which are the built-in functions uh, in some of the toolboxes. Okay, so we're going to take a look at an optimization example, optimizing cell tower position. So you can see here in this graphics, uh, imagine that each circle represents a cell phone tower with its own uh, coverage area. And you can see each tower has a different coverage area. And the objective is to optimize the placement such that we have a nicely, evenly distributed placement of these towers. So we're going to use a functionality from the optimization toolbox. Uh, run it serially and then and then run it paral uh, in parallel to see how much how we can speed it up. All right. So I have this MATLAB app that allows me to simulate this optimization problem, and I can choose a different number of towers. So let's start with a, uh, a small number of towers, 15. We'll hit run. You can see this optimization happening uh, with the animation of the different iterations. You can see that it was pretty quick. Uh, in about three seconds, we were able to uh, converge to a solution. Okay. Now, let's uh, bump it up to a higher number, so 40 towers, and we'll hit Run. And immediately, you'll notice that it's, uh, it's significantly slower. Each iteration is taking a long time, and it's because of the approach that we're taking. We're, we're using a gradient-based optimization solver from the optimization toolbox called fmincon. That's the name of the function. It's a gradient-based solver. So for each iteration, it's, cal it's, it's calculating the gradient by doing, performing many finite difference calculations, okay, to, to figure out what the best gradient is, uh, the gradient is. So, but the, the good news here is that each of these finite difference calculations are essentially independent. So if I have uh, multiple workers, processes to help me with this, uh, this optimization problem, they can all uh, divvy up the, the, the finite difference calculations and run them in parallel and thus uh, speed up this computation. So we're going to do that uh, right now by making use of my uh, dual core laptop that I have here with me. Okay, so you can see here with uh, serial, it took about 30 seconds. So I'm going to first start up uh, workers on my computer, and I'm going to do that from this uh, interface here at the bottom, and I'm going to uh, select Start Parallel Pool. And now you can see here in the status that it says it's starting a pool uh, using the local profile, so it's going to start w workers locally on my computer. Um, and it's you can see here there's a, a functional uh, there's a command, if you want to do it programmatically, there's a command called parpool that allows you to do that. And now you can see that it says it's connected to two workers. Um, this uh, functionality looked into my, my computer and detected that it had two physical cores, so that's why I started two workers. Um, with a toolbox, I can actually start up to 12 workers, uh, so obviously if I have many more cores on my computer, I can start more workers uh, to, to make use of all my, my hardware resources. Now, uh, from this menu here, I can I have access to additional functionalities in the preferences. Uh, there are a couple of uh, very useful um, 
features that I can access from this preference. One is this uh, automatic opening of this pool. Uh, when I'm running a program that uses a uh, construct with a parallel a parallel construct. So this is instead of having me auto manually open up a pool of workers, if I have this checked, I can actually run a program that has parallel constructs already in them and MATLAB will automatically open it up if it doesn't uh, if it uh, doesn't have any workers open already. Okay. I can also choose it to shut down after a few minutes. So if it's idle for a certain number of minutes, I can tell it to shut down and um, kind of preserve the resources, um, especially for a cluster environment. Okay. So in this case, I have uh, connected to two workers. So this main MATLAB is now connected to two additional workers that's running in the background on my computer. Now I can go ahead, I'm going to select Parallel and hit Run. And now the same problem is now running in parallel, and you can probably notice that the, each of these iterations are running a little bit faster because now all those finite difference calculations are running in parallel by using the two workers that we uh, that I provided. Okay, so once it finishes, we'll take a look at what the speed up is. Okay, so about 35% faster. Okay, so it's a significant speed up uh, from 30 seconds down to 22 seconds. Now you might be wondering, it's not a, a perfect speed up, it's not a two times speed up. Uh, naively thinking, I started two workers, so you might expect something that's closer to two times speed up. Well, the reason has to do with what's actually happening uh, in, in the program. So let's take a look at the, the file. Uh, I'm going to search for fmincon, which is the MATLAB function, or the optimization toolbox function. And first, point to, to note is that the way we timed it is by using these commands tick and talk, which are MATLAB functions for timing how long it takes to go from tick to talk. So I'm essentially timing the call to this fmincon optimization toolbox function. So that's that's what we're timing. But just above that, we have a, uh, um, a flag that looks at which radio button I have selected, serial or parallel. If I have parallel selected, I, s I turn on a specific option for my optimization routine that says use parallel always. If I have serial, I say never. And then I just pass in this options into my fmincon function. So this is the only modification, only change that I include to tell my fmincon function to do a parallel optimization. Okay, and everything is already taken care of under the hood inside the fmincon function. So, so very easy, just a flag that you specify. And since we're timing the whole fmincon routine, we're timing the time from the start of the uh, optimization to the end. Now, the only thing, the only part that's being parallelized inside fmincon is the gradient, uh, the finite difference calculations. Everything else in the optimization routine is running serially, so that's why the timing that the the speed up that we see is uh, not uh, two times, but just a portion because we're only timing, uh, we're only parallelizing part of the routine that we're timing. Okay, but still. We can see that this is a uh, significant speed up. If I happen to be on a machine with eight cores or, or 12 cores, I can open up that many workers and I can see a much better speed up than you see here. Okay, so that was just one function from the optimization toolbox. In fact, the optimization toolbox has a couple other functions that behave the same way. You just pass in a flag, use parallel, and then everything is taken care of by the function itself. We also have other toolboxes that are listed here, like, uh, uh, for instance, global optimization, statistics, signal processing. And we do have a list that's growing. Uh, every release, we're adding functionalities to various toolboxes. We're increasing the number of functions for each toolboxes that has a built-in support. So um, I encourage you to take a look at this link here that shows the current state of the list of supported toolbox, uh, toolboxes with uh, built-in parallel support. But all of these are essentially using the functions that are available from the parallel computing toolbox. So they are they're not using any uh special specialized functions just for these toolboxes, but they are using the actual programming constructs that's provide that are provided from the parallel computing toolbox. So let's take a look at what some of those programming constructs are. 
Um, for instance, if if the things that you're trying to do uh, is not uh, one of those uh, built-in support toolbox functions, what can you do? Or maybe you might still have a pro problem that's perfect for parallel computing. That's when you can start to use, uh, utilize some of these uh, simple uh, constructs. As you saw in the cell tower example, uh, you can imagine one of the ideal problem problems for doing parallel computing is problems that involve running many iterations that are independent, uh, such as parameter sweep. Uh, studies and Monte Carlo simulations, those are running similar simulations over and over again with different parameter sets. Completely independent, uh, they don't depend, the results don't depend on results from other iterations. So you can easily take that and make them run in parallel and thus uh, decrease the amount of time it takes to process the, the, the problem. So let's take a look at a simple parameter sweep example. We're going to look at this uh, damped spring oscillator. It's a second order differential equation system. Uh, the basic idea is that we have this second order system with parameters that we want to, to vary, uh, uh, namely B and K. And then for each com uh, parameter combination, we want to solve the ordinary differential equation, uh, measure a particular metric that we're interested in, which uh, in this case is the peak response or the peak value, and then we can uh, create a graphics that looks um, something like this here. Okay, so we're going to do this in serial, and then we're going to convert that uh, so that we can run it in parallel. All right. So we have the program written already here. It's a, a fairly straightforward program. I'm going to first run it because it takes uh, uh, 15 seconds or so to run. So while it's running, I'll explain the code. Uh, basically, it's, there are a couple parameters that specifies how many iterations for combinations of B and K, so 60 and 60 for a total of 3,600. All right, that's, that was the result. And then the main part of the simulation is this for loop, uh, essentially going through each of the combinations of the parameter sets, um, and we're passing it into a uh, helper function odsystem.m, which is a function that uh, I've written, MATLAB file, and then we're solving it using a MATLAB built-in OD solver, OD45. We get the result, and then we capture the maximum value, store it into a, a variable, and then we visualize it using another helper function, which uh, is the plot that you just saw. Okay, and then we have uh, the tick and talk function here to time how long it takes to do the iteration, uh, the for loops. So I'm we're simply we're just timing the uh, the loops. Okay, so it took roughly 16 seconds. Now this is a perfect uh, problem for parallel processing because each iteration is completely independent of each other. Uh, the order doesn't matter. I can do it in any order that I want. So it's perfect for, for parallel processing. All I need to do is convert my for loop to a par 4, which means parallel for loop. Now I'm, I, I've just instructed MATLAB to run this loop in parallel uh, if it detects a MATLAB worker or MATLAB workers. Now, note that I still have MATLAB workers open, uh, started from before, which I never shut down. So uh, it's it's already ready and and and, and able to take uh, some computational work. So I can go ahead and hit run, and now MATLAB will see the par4 command, recognize that it has two workers, and automatically split up the the uh, iterations into two two workers. Okay. Now you can see that it has perfect speed up, actually more than two times speed up. This, uh, the reason it's uh, more than two is, is probably some caching to do with caching for, for the timing. Typically when you uh, do benchmarks, you want to run each of these uh, timing routines multiple times to make sure that uh, the cache is, is settled and, and you have a, a steady uh, timing result. So if you do this multiple times for both, you'll probably get still around two times speed up. But the idea here is that we're only timing just the for loop, 
not, we're not timing any of the setup code, any of the serial portion of the code. There's also probably minimal data transfer, so not much uh, overhead. So you see a very good speed up by using two workers, and the, the for loop is, is uh, nicely distributed amongst the two, um, two workers. Now, the reason this worked nicely was because this problem was uh, as a completely independent loop, uh, and that is a hard requirement for PAR4 to work. If I were to introduce, for instance, uh, a dependency, an artificial dependency, index minus one. So I've just introduced a dependency. Now you can see that uh, MATLAB gave me this warning, MATLAB code analyzer, which is a static code analyzer that's constantly running in the background. It detected that there was some dependency in the code, and it gave me an error saying that PAR4 would not work with the way this, uh, this code is written. So the, the code analyzer is always there to give you hints and, and a warning if it detects something that might not work in a parallel environment. All right. All right, so there are other simple constructs. Uh, we'll talk about them uh, later on. These are more suitable for, for cluster computing and, and working with large data, so I'll leave that for, for later. Uh, if you want more control, so PAR4 batch, these are things that are very easy, so it gives you some control, but um, it's, it's, again, still meant for a certain type of, for, of programs. Like, if you have a for loop, then it's great for a par for loop but uh, there may be other cases where you may want more control of how you might want to to have your parallel application run and that's when you can start using some of these advanced constructs such as uh, creating create job uh, creating jobs and tasks which allows you to create individual iterations that you want to run in parallel labs and SPMD these are more for inter worker communication so if you want the different workers to communicate to each other and pass data back and forth you can use some of these uh, constructs to get that full control alright so that's it for for things you can do on the CPU side switching gears uh, let's talk about things you can do on the GPU side now, GPU, as the name suggests, is uh, originally meant for doing graphics rendering and graphics processing, graphics acceleration. Uh, many computers have GPU cards, graphics cards, but nowadays, um, more recently, people have started using some high-end GPU cards for scientific computing. Uh, and because of the nature of how they're structured and architectured, they're great at certain type of operations, certain type of integer and floating point operations, and they're very efficient and there are many uh, processors, processing units to help you do massively parallel applications. And it also has its own onboard uh, device memory, so you can do some uh, fast uh, uh, computation on those data that's on the GPU card. Now with the parallel computing toolbox, you, uh, it allows you to work with a uh, uh, NVIDIA GPU card with a specific uh, compute capability. As you can see here, compute capability 1.3 or greater. Uh, so if you have a GPU card of this uh, spec, uh, you'll be able to use Parallel Computing Toolbox to, to do some GPU computing. Now this compute capability, uh, this I, I wouldn't worry about because uh, the GPU cards that you would get from, from NVIDIA nowadays are well beyond 1.3, there are 2, 2.4, and, and higher. So um, basically, if, you, if you're if you going to do GPU computing from, from now, the, the GPU card you would get will most likely be, you know, very well likely be uh, uh, supported by the parallel computing toolbox. Now, because of the architecture, the difference in architecture compared to CPU, the way you would use it is also very different. Uh, as you've seen up to this point, uh, the way you use CPUs is to start up MATLAB workers and have them run on the various, uh, various cores. On the GPU, you don't start workers, but instead you can send instructions and commands for these individual cores to, to do. So you directly, or MATLAB directly talks to these cores uh, by sending instructions and commands. It also makes use of the device memory. So there are simple MATLAB commands that allow you to transfer data onto the device memory, and then you can uh, issue a command to do 
some operations on the data that's on the GPU. Okay. Uh, similar to on the CPU side, uh, we have various ways of uh, allowing you to use GPU uh, GPU card. There are things that are already built into toolboxes. But also, there are uh, simple and advanced programming constructs that allow you to uh, directly manipulate um, uh, the GPU card that you have available to you. Uh, things like a GPU array, which allows you to send data onto the GPU. And once you do that, you can just do uh, normal arith arithmetic, and then the computation will happen on the GPU. Also, uh, commands like array fun and VX, uh, BSX fun allows you to uh, write some function and then have it operate through all the cores that's available on the GPU. Okay. If you want to go even further down, uh, and for those of you who are familiar with CUDA, uh, which is a sort of a C-based or C-like language that allows you to control NVIDIA GPU cards, uh, if you have CUDA code that's uh, lying around or if you're planning to write CUDA code, you can take that, compile it, and then easily run it from within MATLAB using the Parallel Computing Toolbox. So this, the lower interface for experts, really gives you that lowest level control of GPU card that you have using the technology that's really built for controlling the NVIDIA GPU cards. But uh, we're not going to go too much uh, into uh, any of these uh, today, but uh, if you go to the GPU page, uh, the link shown here, mathworks.com slash GPU, or it's also linked off the Parallel Computing tool, uh, Toolbox page, uh, you'll get a lot of information uh, about using GPUs, including a dedicated webinar on it. But we'll, let's take a look at a, a simple example. Um, we're not going to run this live, but uh, uh, this is a uh, a second order wave equation example where we're trying to uh, solve this system that you can see the equation down below but this is a a problem that's perfect for the GPU because the the technique that we're using here is a uh, as a spectral method which uses a lot of FFTs and inverse FFTs uh, both of which are, are perfect uh, types of uh, calculations to, to run on a GPU okay so you can see here on the right uh, a simple benchmark plot um, that shows running this problem at different problem size. So the grid size uh, kind of relates to the problem size, the complexity of the problem. And then the computation time is the amount of time it take, took to compute 50 iterations or 50 time steps. So you can see here GPU is uh, significantly faster than the CPU, but it, it does depend on the size of the problem. Uh, it becomes faster and faster as you increase the size of the problem or as you make the problem more complex. But for a very small problem, you actually see a uh, degradation of performance. Uh, CPU becomes faster. And that's because the for a small problem, the computation is really so fast that the overhead of transferring data back and forth uh, to the GPU uh, dominates over the computation time. So you're actually seeing the communication overhead um, effect for very small problems. But for bigger problems, you're taking much more significant time doing the computation, so the transport time is is uh, relatively insignificant, uh, and that's why you get a, a good speed up for the GPU. Okay. So when you're thinking about whether the the type of problem that you're trying to do is suitable for GPU computing. It's, it's You have to think about the, the size of the problem, the complexity of the problem, the types of functions that you're, you're, you're calling, whether they're um, uh, good for GPUs or, or not. And all the, those information are available in the, the GPU page, the web page that I, I showed you in the previous slide, so you can get a lot of information there. All right, so we looked at uh, various ways of using your local resources to do parallel computing. Now let's take a look at how you can scale up to a cluster uh, environment. We're going to start off with looking at a, a simple example using the parameter sweep example that we've been using. Uh, but instead of using the local hardware resources, my, my laptop, I'm going to use workers running on a cluster hardware. All right, so here's a piece of code that we've been working with. And before we had this, uh, my 
pool of workers running locally. So I'm gonna go ahead and shut down my uh, parallel pool uh, that was running locally. And then from the, the home tab, under the uh, parallel uh, control, I can select a different profile. Now I'll explain about I'll explain profiles in a little bit, but basically I have two profiles. One is the local profile that instructs MATLAB to, to use my local hardware resources. And the other one that I have here is a is a cluster that I have access to, which has 32 CPU cores and uh, configured to to run 32 MATLAB workers. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, select that profile, the cluster profile. And with that, I can go ahead and uh, start up my parallel pool again. And you'll see here from this message that now it's starting a pool using the profile that I selected from that drop-down menu. So instead of local, it's using the cluster profile that I have. And again, this is a, a, a separate machine that I have access to that has 32 CPU cores with 32 MATLAB workers running. And I'm now asking to uh, connect to that from my my uh, client MATLAB session. All right, so it says that it's connected to 32 workers. So with that, I can go ahead and uh, run my script again, and you can see in a few seconds it was able to co uh, complete the computation. So it was a a very significant speed up that you're seeing here. But let me run it uh, a couple more times. Um, first few times, it'll uh, it's gonna try to cache some some of the com computation, so it's gonna you know, see a little bit of speed up. But it seems like 1.2 is is a steady time that I'm getting. So so it's a it's a pretty good speed up that I'm getting here. Uh, but if we take a look at uh, this message here that it's displaying, it says analyzing and transferring files to the workers. So what it's doing is that here I'm doing a cluster computing so everything inside of this PAR4 is running on a worker that's outside of this much machine so that wor those workers need to have all the files necessary to run so in my case this OD system.m is a user-defined file that it only exists on my computer so that this file needs to be transferred to all the workers so this is what this uh, this map the what MATLAB is doing automatically that it's analyzing my this script and identifying any necessary files that it needs to transfer and it's doing that for me automatically. So once this is, this is uh, transferred over then everything inside this Power 4 loop is, is, uh, can now run uh, uh, normally on all the workers on the cluster. Now for the, the speed up, uh, it, it was uh, 1.2 seconds, which is a significant speed up from from the, the even from the local workers that I'm using, but it's not a uh, 32 times as fast, uh, even though I'm using 32 workers. And what we're looking, what we're seeing here is the the effect of the overhead. So in this case, we're looking at the communication overhead uh, through the network because I have my computer connected to the internet and then uh, connected to the cluster. So uh, in order for there to be a communication for my MATLAB to communicate to the workers, there needs to be data transfer going back and forth. So there's always this uh, communication overhead. So it's going to be affected by how strong this uh, the connection that I have to my cluster. Um, I'm doing this interactive parallel processing as a demonstration, but typically when I when we do cluster computing, you want to be you don't want to be doing this interactive parallel processing, but instead you want to be doing batch processing. And I'll talk more about how to do batch processing later, but here I'm, I'm doing this as a demonstration that you can simply change the profile from the drop-down menu and then do uh, parallel pool open and it autom automatically opens on, on the cluster side. Okay, so let's think about what's what just happened. Um, so I have my MATLAB code that I was running locally before using two workers on my laptop, but what was actually happening in the be uh, behind the scenes was that it was using the parallel, uh, the local profile uh, uh, for from the parallel menu. So that was instructing MATLAB to start up workers locally on whatever local hardware that I had. Okay, but once I have access to a cluster. So setting up a cluster is, is, a, is a task for the system admin and the IT person, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. But the final step of 
enabling a cluster and setting up a cluster is to create uh, the profile for that computer cluster. So the profile includes information such as the, the host name of the main computer of the cluster, uh, the number of workers that this cluster has, how it's, uh, it's connected, the version of MATLAB that's installed, and, and so forth. So all that information is included in the, the profile for that cluster. And then on my client MATLAB, I can simply import that profile and then just replace it by selecting from the, the drop-down menu, just like I did. And then when I run my code, it'll automatically get uh, ran on the computer cluster. So why would I want to run, use the cluster in the first place? Well, the first reason is that uh, it allows you to offload your computation, and we'll talk about uh, batch processing, that, uh, that's the, the mechanism for offloading the computation. But by, by offloading your computation, it frees up your local MATLAB session and your local desktop so you can do other computations on your local computer. Uh, with a computer cluster you may have access to a better computer with better uh, hardware so you might be able to get some uh, benefits just by using a cl cluster resource. Also, you just like in this case, you may have access to more cores. Uh, so my laptop has two cores but I have access to a 32 core cluster so with more cores you can expect a uh, greater speed up, uh, so you can really uh, um, uh, speed up the computation time. And then we haven't really talked about this yet, but uh, in addition to additional computational resources, you have access to memory resources. So you may be able to deal with larger pro problems that you couldn't solve on a on your local machine because of the the memory constraints. Now, when you offload computations it's not only about parallel uh, uh, scripts that you can offload. You can offload anything that you would run in MATLAB. Even serial MATLAB code that just takes some uh, amount of time and you just want to offload that to one of the workers on the computer cluster and, and let it do the computation while you, you do other things on your lo uh, local MATLAB. You can do that and that's uh, really a, um, a legitimate way of doing offload computation using the cluster. Now the nice thing is that all the, the infrastructure is there to, to allow for file transfer, uh, the file dependency, if you need to add a path that to a, to a network path that has your data, you can do that. It also has some uh, uh, mechanism for monitoring the progress of your job, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. And you can easily retrieve the result from the cluster. So it, the, the whole infrastructure is there to make it easy for you to offload your computation. And obviously, if the, the computation that you're offloading has some parallel constructs, you can also make use of the additional workers to, do, to scale, uh, scale up your computation. So to offload a computation, you would use the function batch, which is the uh, function from the Parallel Computing Toolbox. Uh, it simply allows you to tell what kind of MATLAB program that you want to uh, offload. And when you do that, your work gets sent to one of the workers in, on the cluster. And then that worker is going to just do the computation as if that worker is you. And while it's doing that, it's completely offloaded. So you can do other th computations, other things on your client MATLAB. The, the desktop MATLAB. But once the computation is finished, you can connect back to the cluster and then retrieve the result for any post-processing that you might need to do. Now if the program that you're batching has parallel constructs, you can specify the pool uh, parameter and then now that worker that you talk to will have access to the other workers in the cluster and, and, and make use of that to do parallel processing on the program that you just batched off. Same thing, uh, the result will be stored in, in the cluster and then at a later time you can go ahead and uh, retrieve the result uh, from the cluster. Alright, so let's take a, a, a simple look at a simple example for batch. Now we're, we're actually going to use the same uh, parameter sweep example but uh, let me uh, clean up first and uh, open up the, the script for, for batch processing. Now for this one, uh, since we're going to do this offload uh, computation, I'm going to close the interactive uh, pool of workers that I had open for the cluster. Okay. Now to, to batch, uh, here's the, uh, the command, the batch function. I specify the name of the script or function. 
So in this case, this is the uh, the function version of the parameter sweep script that we looked at before. It's the same uh, bit of code inside as before, but instead it's, it's instead of a script, I'm using a function so that I can pass in uh, a number for the number of uh, values for B and number of values for K. Uh, so I can change that on the fly and has um, uh, four output arguments that it's returning. So here I specify the name of the file, so in this case the function, and then how many outputs that I expect, so four outputs, and these are the input arguments to the function. Uh, I can optionally uh, specify uh, the profile that I'm using, so I can put it, uh, programmatically specify it, and let me just run it. And when I do that, batch will kind of package up the file and get the necessary helper functions, send it over, and once it sends it over, then I get control back of my command window. So I can type in other things while the computation is already being carried out in the cluster. So I can plot things. Um, because it's completely offloaded, it's not even using any computational resources on my computer, so I can do things that are computationally intensive uh, on my uh, client MATLAB as well. <coughs> now while it's running, I can monitor the progress by opening up the job monitor. And here you can see that it, uh, here's the job that I just submitted. Uh, it's, it has uh, um, one task and it's currently running. And uh, I, can, I can tell it to update every so often or I can manually update it. So I can have this monitor open on the side while I do other things uh, on my computer. And I can, if, it, if an error happens, it'll tell me uh, here and I can even look at the, what the error message is if, if it were to happen. So it has a, a lot of mechanism to uh, query and see what's happening inside the job uh, while it's running on the cluster. Okay, so so that example was uh, just running that, that function just regularly like a single function. So even though it had a par 4, I'm just running it as a single serial uh, batch job but it is written with a parallel constructor, so it can run in a parallel fashion. So in this case, I'm specifying a pool, and I'm requesting, in addition to one worker, I'm requesting 30 additional workers to do this as a parallel uh, processing uh, pro uh, program. Okay, so this will request in total of 31, because the batch by itself will always request one, and then in addition to that, uh, requesting 30. Okay, so I just submitted submitted the second job. So if I go back and, and update it, you'll see two jobs listed, the one from before, and then the second one, which was just submitted. Now it's, it has, it's using 31 tasks, okay? Uh, if you look at this, uh, the first job, you can see that it's already finished. So it's, it's been running for uh, about a minute uh, already. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's already finished. Um, the second one, uh, it says it's still running, but uh, this one will take only uh, a shorter amount of time to run because now it's running in parallel using 30 workers. So with the same problem, it should be significantly faster. So if I go ahead and update it again, uh, I should say it is finished. And yes, it is finished. So now I have two jobs that are completed and the results are are stored in, in, on the cluster and waiting for it to be uh, retrieved by, by this MATLAB. So to retrieve it, I, I simply use the fetch outputs function. Okay, so let me just run this. And it's gonna, so I'm gonna retrieve the job from the second job, so that's the 30 worker job. And then if you look at what the output looks like, it's the four outputs from the function, because the function returned four outputs. And the first output is the uh, the time it took, competition time, so three and a half seconds to, to run using 30 workers. And then these are the other arguments, uh, variables that I asked for. Okay, so let me just, uh, uh, once I have the output, I can use that output to do any post-processing that I, I want to do. So in this case, I, I might want to visualize, for instance. Okay, so I let me retrieve the result from the first uh, job as well, and then just compare the computation time for the two cases. Okay, and we can see that uh, 
about 73 seconds or so seconds for if I were to just use one worker and then three and a half seconds for 30 workers. So that's about 20 to 25 times speed up by using 30 workers. So that's a pretty good speed up um, uh, using the, the workers on, on the cluster. Now once I'm done, it's, it's a good practice to, to always clean up afterwards by simply deleting. So when I delete a job, it deletes all the temporary data, the results that's uh, stored on the, on the cluster. So until I delete it, the results may re, re, remain on the cluster indefinitely. Uh, so you could retrieve the result later on, but typically once you're done with it, it's good practice to simply delete it. And uh, once I delete it, we can go back and look at the monitor and you'll see that the jobs will go away from the monitor. All right. So this is just uh, showing you the benchmark of this parameter sweep study, but we tested it for much larger number of workers. So we went all the way up to 192 workers. And uh, so you can see for 192 workers, we, went, we got about 160 speed up. So it's a pretty good speed up, uh, close to linear speed up, as you can see on this graph. But as you increase the number of workers, you have multiple workers across multiple computers. So there's going to be a little bit of overhead that's start to come into play. So you see this uh, effect overhead as you increase the number of workers. But still, uh, this is a nice parallelizable problem that allows you to uh, uh, get a good speed up. The other type of problem that we haven't looked at is the large data problem. So instead of breaking up the computation, you can break up the, the data that you have. So if you have uh, each worker storing portions of your large variable, and you can have those workers talk to each other, and and, uh, and then you can do some large arithmetics uh, with the data distributed across multiple workers, which could be possibly over multiple computers. So here's just a uh, an example of this large data distributed uh, uh, computation. We're do looking at a uh, large matrix uh, multiplication example where we look at two matrices of the size, uh, in this case 4,000 by 4,000, uh, two matrices of that size, all the way up to 40,000 by 40,000. Now one of the things you first notice is, is the, the benefit of memory, having more memory. So for a fewer number of workers and fewer number of computers, you just possibly can't deal with this large problem because you just run out of memory. So by having more workers and more computers, you can deal with much larger problems which you couldn't possibly work with, uh, deal with uh, in, uh, on a single computer. So you have that uh, memory benefit. But on top of the memory uh, advantage, you also get a speed uh, benefit, as you can see here on this plot. So if you look at any uh, size matrix, you can see that as you have more workers and more computers, you can make use of the fact that you have more processing power to, to deal with that problem. So you see a significant speed up uh, in terms of computation time uh, for this uh, matrix multiplication problem. All right. so. Let's uh, see what's happening, uh, what's making this all, all possible. So in the back end, what's uh, happening is it's, it's using a uh, product called a MATLAB Distributed Computing Server, which is a MathWorks product, which enables you to make a, uh, a computer cluster a, a MATLAB cluster. But you can really think of it as an extension to desktop parallel computing. So the parallel computing toolbox allows you to do parallel processing on your desktop machine. But then with the MATLAB distributed computing server, you can extend that to a, a cluster environment, uh, but uh, seamlessly, seamlessly extend from a desktop parallel computing to a cluster parallel computing. It also has this pre-built framework and infrastructure, uh, things like the communication between different workers, communication between the workers and, and, and the client, uh, communications between the workers and, and the schedulers. All those infrastructures is there uh, so that uh, you can easily do this uh, scaling up to a cluster environment. Uh, and finally, it has this uh, simplified licensing to, to make it very easy to maintain uh, amongst multiple users. And what I mean by that is that it's using a dynamic licensing model uh, because typically a computer cluster is a shared resource where you have multiple users accessing the same resource. But all these different users may have a, a very different license profile. Uh, user A may have statistics toolbox and signal processing toolbox. User B may have a, a curve fitting toolbox and optimization toolbox. But all those users 
need to use a cluster, same cluster resource. So what we have is the, the computer cluster uh, uh, has all the products installed with the MATLAB distributed computing server. So everything, the software is there available for any user to, to access. And the license is mirrored by the user who access the cluster. So it mirrors whatever license profile that a particular user has, and that user will be able to access that uh, uh, product on the cluster. On top of that, the cluster does not check out any of those toolbox or MATLAB licenses. It will only check out the server license, which is the number of workers that's licensed to that MATLAB distributed computing server. Okay, so it doesn't uh, use up any of the uh, toolbox licenses that any individual user may need to use. And finally, we talked about offloading. Uh, because you can offload and you can even exit MATLAB, uh, that uh, person who submitted the job can release the MATLAB license so that other people can use MATLAB for, for their own standalone use. Uh, and um, in this case, we're talking about if it's a concurrent license. So it uh, allows you to kind of release the MATLAB license that was used for submission. Now there's also this piece of uh, software called a scheduler that manages all this communication between the users and the, the workers. And we have uh, support for various types of schedulers uh, that would work with the cluster. Now the, the easiest is the, the scheduler that ships with MATLAB Distributed Computing Server, which is the MATLAB Job Scheduler. This is a very lightweight, easy to set up uh, scheduler, and this is really meant for people who are just creating a, a cluster for the first time or uh, may not have an existing cluster, but they just want to create one uh, really quickly from scratch. You can use a scheduler that comes with the MATLAB distributed computing server, very easy to set up. But if you already have a cluster and have a, a scheduler on the cluster, we can also integrate with the, your existing scheduler uh, by, uh, for many of the, the common schedulers out there, we have a direct support for it with uh, a simple integration to our MATLAB distributed computing server. But for other schedulers that we don't have a direct support for, we also have an open API uh, to support uh, any other software, uh, any other schedulers that you might have there so that we can uh, always integrate to your existing uh, hardware and software setup that you might have. Okay, but we have more information that available to you on the, the link that's shown on this slide. All right, so so in summary, so the parallel computing tools, it's uh, this is a, a tool that's really designed for a general MATLAB user who may not be an expert in parallel computing or computer science, who is just a, uh, a typical MATLAB user, to create a parallel application and to make use of the local hardware resources or a cluster hardware resource. Okay, allows you to speed up your computation on your computer uh, using CPUs, GPUs, or scale up their cluster by using MDCS. And uh, for the, the, the last case where if you're using the cluster, you can use the parallel computing toolbox to, to prototype, use your local desktop as a prototyping environment. Make sure that your application works exactly the, you way, in the way you want it. And then once you know that it works, then you can easily scale up to a cluster just by changing that profile from the drop-down menu. All right. So for more information, here's a link to our Parallel Computing page. It has uh, additional information about Parallel Computing, GPU Computing, Cluster Computing, as videos and examples and demos, additional webinars that's related to this. So I highly recommend you to take a look at this uh, link here to get more information about Parallel Computing.